Now we're going to be begin the session four of the online A to Z in dental implant therapy. The goal is to take our understanding of the anterior implant restorations to an advanced level, both from the point of view of the concerns we have surgically to achieve the ideal implant placement so we have the best possible chance of achieving an ideal restorative result, but also from the point of view of how do we manage some of the less than ideal implant placements to achieve the best possible result. Of course, I, I, as I've stated before, I'm an advocate of a team effect, uh, not just uh, the restorative dentist doing everything or even, as we see a lot today, the surgeon doing everything, but the more that we all understand our roles and the more that we all do the things that we need to do, I think we get a better result. Um, I'm very fortunate when I work with outstanding surgeons, when I have an outstanding laboratory, uh, basically my restorations are very simple to achieve. We also should include the patient in terms of this team effect. Um, is this result that you see here a perfect aesthetic result? No, of course not. But is it one that the patient loved? Yes, because they understood the limitations, they understood the challenges, they realized they'd lost more than just their teeth, they'd lost soft tissue, they'd lost bone, uh, they may have had a, a reduction in the amount of lip support, but all that was acceptable in terms of the result that they had. And, and for the restorative dentist to learn how to speak to the patients in that way so that they can achieve what they want and make sure that they'll be comfortable with that final result, I think is a great advantage. Now I hate to, you know, start off a lecture series and, and I, I, intentionally I did not with historical issues. Uh, my goal isn't to go back and reteach you history, but the problem is I still see people making these same mistakes, whether they don't understand the biology or if they're just choosing to ignore it because it's easier, it's very frustrating to me. And so I think we should talk about some things that are obviously obvious. One of them, of course, is the reality that we all know is that the moment we extract the tooth, we're going to lose bone especially a maxillary anterior tooth, in a relatively short time we lose the labial plate and we can often lose a great percentage of the socket shape and we end up with a less than ideal contour to, uh, of the ridge. We might be able to place an implant, but where would the implant be placed? It would be placed much more palatally than would be ideal. We also have the contour to the soft tissue, a non-ideal shape of the soft tissue, which forces us to do what we call a ridge lap, to achieve the restoration, which ends up the restoration looking like it's just floating above the tissue. And plus, we often end up with this triangle, this dark hole. How do we get rid of that? I'd like to point out now that there really is no guaranteed surgical procedure that could make this papilla grow back. There isn't. Basically, as we've stated before, the papilla is based on the bone. If the bone isn't there, the papilla won't be there. But from a restorative point of view, are there ways that we could restore that papilla? And certainly, uh, by thinking about the adjacent tooth, the natural tooth, and the implant restoration, we could change the contour of both and essentially fill that, rest, that, uh, that black hole by half of the space coming from the natural tooth and half coming from the implant. So we maintain kind of bilateral symmetry. We achieve the ability to close the space and the truth is, rarely do the patients notice that the papilla isn't quite as tall, especially right at the midline, but they do notice that there's a big black hole there. But in other words, this is a challenge. Why is it a challenge? The implant was placed in the wrong spot. It was ignored, uh, the fact that we had lost bone and soft tissue, and a restoration was attempted anyway. There are, of course, many very predictable techniques for labial deficiency. Uh, both from uh, a bone graft point of view, from a soft tissue, a connective tissue point of view. We can uh, increase the, the dimensions horizontally of the soft tissue very predictably and regularly. And remember that even though it may not improve the implant position, it may improve the way the crown looks as it comes out of the tissue. And for many patients, especially I've had some women patients comment that when they have a defect in that labial position, even when they put lipstick on, they feel that hole. And even though their teeth might look nice, they feel this depression, which is very uh, disappointing to them. And so filling that labial depression does have value. I'd like to talk for a few minutes about the predictability of the papilla around these restorations. And we can look back at a study originally done by Dennis Tarnow to look at the soft tissue pr predictability around natural teeth. And when we realized that in his point of view, 
you could do nothing to the soft tissue. And if the bone was healthy, you would 100% of the time grow a papilla five millimeters above that bone. It tells you something. You could fill that space if it was six millimeters in height about half the time, but only 25% if it was seven millimeters. So certainly our goal is to keep the bone within about five millimeters of our desired interproximal contact. When we do that, we'll fill the space 100% of the time. I realize sometimes that the shape of my restorations need to be considered on that basis. If I realize that there's going to be a significant deficit of bone and to fill that space, I can't do it completely with soft tissue. I, I treatment plan some sort of restoration on the adjacent tooth and the implant crown to make up for that space. You know, when we look at a case like this and we try to think about possible treatment planning, well, you know, we see a papilla on the adjacent uh, lateral incisors, mesial and distal, but we see this huge defect in the center of the central incisors. So do we attempt to remove the central incisors, graft straight across so we have plenty of bone back, then place implants? Do we remove all four teeth and place implants in the lateral incisors? You know, there's so many options that we need to consider. But the bottom line is until we have bone, we're not going to really have the soft tissue. Our goal in all our surgical procedures is to maximize the amount of bone, place the implant ideally, and then if we have some resorption, we still have plenty of bone. Another thing uh, that I'd like to justify is what I've been talking about over the last three sessions is that why the head of the implant needs to be where it does. And if you look at really hundreds of cases um, from many different uh, clinical practitioners, Berglund, Boozer, Cochran, Jovanovic, you realize that if you analyze the gingival margin to the junctal epithelium, the junctional epithelium to the alveolar bone crest, the total soft tissue height is approximately two and three quarters to four millimeters. Now, that implies that if we place the head of the implant two to two and a half millimeters below the desired emergence profile, create the maximum amount of bone around the implant, even with a little bone loss down below the, the top of the implant, we're going to maintain that height of soft tissue very easily. And so that thought that, okay, I, I don't want to show the head of my implant, so I'm going to sink it in further, we have to realize that just means it pulls the soft tissue with the head of the implant. And that's basically the way I look at it. From a restorative point of view, uh, this was a very important study and, and something that brings out how rapidly we can restore cases in relationship to the soft tissue. Yes, it, it is a biologic fact that implants integrate faster than they have uh, previously because of the surface texture on top of the implants, but the soft tissue still has a fairly standard uh, healing rate that may be as long as six months. So if you're planning to do a restoration, especially where the implant was placed as a two-stage procedure, we completely lost the soft tissue contours, and then they were redeveloped, that we really should think about having a provisional restoration in there for about six months so that we can totally allow the soft tissue to regenerate.